together. Amen. 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 Be seated. Thank you, Paul, worship team, for leading us this morning. Well, it is a tragic thing to get a song stuck in your head. Has that ever happened to you? You know, you just innocently going through your day, and all of a sudden a song pops into your, your brain, and you just can't get it out of your, your mind. And, and I guarantee you, after we play a little bit of this, the clip of this song that uh, got stuck in my mind, you're going to be blaming me later on this week. I can't get it out of my mind. So um, here, here's the song. Play, just play the first, like, three little stanzas. I'll, I'll tell you when to stop there. See, I told you, you're going to keep thinking. You already know what it is, right? Blinded by the light, wrapped up like a douche, another owner in the night. Blinded by the light, wrapped up like a douche, another owner in the night. Blinded by the light. All right. We can they, thank you. All right, so it, it's incredible. This uh song, by the way, a couple of factoids about it, was written by Bruce Springsteen, of all people, of, in 1973, released on an album of his, but it didn't become famous until Manfred Mann's Earth Band <laughs> recorded it in 1976. It went all the way to number one in uh, February of 1977. I remember this song as a, as a child. I was uh, fascinated by the lyrics because they had no practical meaning to them. Um, in just a second, we're going to show the, the lyrics to the first part. Madman drummers, bummers, Indians in the summer with a teenage diplomat. I, I remember as a kid, what were they smoking in the 70s, you know? It's crazy. They're writing all these lyrics. They don't mean anything. In the dumps with the mumps as the adolescent pumps his way into his hat with a boulder on my shoulder, feeling kind of older, I tripped the merry-go-round with this very unpleasing sneezing and wheezing, the calliope crashed to the ground. The calliope crashed to the ground. Go ahead. See if you can figure out what this song is about. Okay, very good. So, so what does it mean, right? What does it mean? Well, Springsteen says that while he was writing this song, his rhyming notebook caught on fire. Now, literally, probably it did. But many of the words were really biographical in nature. And once you understand, then you can say, okay, now I kind of understand where he's trying to go with this. So Madman Drummer's Bummers was about his drummer, Vinny, the Mad Dog Lopez, Indians in the Summer was his Little League baseball team as a, as a child. In the Dumps with the Mumps chronicles a real-life problem that he had. He, he had the, the mumps one summer while he was a teenager. And uh, he, uh, a boulder on my shoulder is the huge chip that he felt he carried around uh, the weight of the world. And the calliope crashed to the ground, which begs the question, what in the world is a calliope? Well, I looked it up. Here's what it is. <laughs> it's a calliope. <laughs> I can see why it needed to crash to the ground, right? All right, so blinded by the light, revved up like a deuce. Well, what's a deuce? A 1932 Ford that they used the light to make into hot rods, and Bruce Springsteen was into cars, and they raced them at night. So that's blinded by the light, revved up like a deuce. Um, another runner, another race car in, in the night. You say, well, what does this have to do with Romans chapter 11, verse 7 through 10? Glad you asked. 
You see, in Romans chapter 11, verses 7 through 10, Paul is going to continue his point that he was trying to make in verses 1 through 6 to bring home with the conclusion he will support with two slightly confusing Old Testament passages unless you understand what they are about, the context behind them. So just like blinded by the light now makes a little bit more sense because we've, we've looked behind the words to see kind of what they were meaning, that they had a personal context, so too will Paul's conclusion make better sense to us when we understand the proofs, the Old Testament passages that he uses to make his point. So if you brought your Bible with you this morning, and I hope that you did, I'd invite you to join me in Romans chapter 11 as we look at verses 7 through 10. Paul is writing, and this is what he says, what then? What Israel sought so earnestly, it did not obtain, but, but the elected, the others were hardened as it was written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes so that they could not see, and ears so that they could not hear to this very day. And David says, may their table become a snare and a trap a stumbling block and a retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. What in the world does it mean? What is Paul trying to communicate it with us? Now, you have to remember that, that Paul has already started down this road in Romans 11.1 1, when he wants to prove that God did not reject his own people. This is the point that he's making, and he's going to continue to make that point even in the verses we're studying this morning. Last week, you might remember that he gave us two very strong proofs that God was not finished with his people, that God did not reject his people. And, and the proofs were powerful because, first of all, proof number one was Saul of Tarsus. That was Paul himself. He was a, a, an Israelite. He was a Jew. He was a Pharisee. And God didn't give up on him because he pursued him, remember, with reckless abandon. And the one who was persecuting his own church, God magnificently appeared to, Jesus Christ appeared to him. And Paul, he went from Saul of Tarsus, persecutor of the Christians, to Paul, the apostle of grace, who went to declare the good news of Jesus Christ far and wide. And then we saw the second proof, and that is that, that Paul points out, look, that God has always have, had a remnant chosen by grace. And he pointed us back to Elijah when Elijah was on Mount Carmel, taking on the prophets of Baal. And, uh, and uh, Elijah said, well, I'm the only one left. It's just me against the world, God. And they're looking, they're trying to kill me. And God declared to Elijah, you know, there's seven, I have 7,000 that I've set apart for myself that have not bent the knee to Baal. And I pointed out to you last week, it could have been, God could have said, well, I have one or two, or I have 12, or I have 200, but God said, I have 7,000, which again raises uh, our expectation of what the remnant is, that it's not uh, perhaps just a, a small few people, but maybe it's larger than that. Maybe God has in mind a, a larger amount of people that he wants to choose by grace to know and be known by his love. And so Paul says, now, even now, in this day and time, there's a remnant chosen by grace uh, of Jews, because that's the context that he's writing in. So in the first six verses, they all add up to the reality that God is not finished with the Jews, that he has not cast off the nation uh, of Israel, and as the writer of Saul of Tarsus and the remnant uh, illustrate. God is preserving, always preserving a people, a grace chosen people for his purposes, for his glory, for his name's sake. Then we notice in verse 7 that Paul uh, quotes some Old Testament passages. You see, he wants to support his point with Scripture, which is uh, always 
a, a great thing that um, when you're making a point that you don't just say, well, this is my opinion, but you point back to Scripture and see how God has made this point already. You're just emphasizing it. You're reiterating it, that God is on mission to save people. He, he's seeking to save those who are lost. That's what Jesus said. This is my mission. The Father has sent me in order that I might seek and save those who are lost. And so Paul's saying, look, the, the children of, of Israel, the people of Israel, the Jewish people, God has not rejected them. In fact, he's still pursuing them. And, and let me show you that by, by pointing you back to the Old Testament and showing you that God's not done with them. So we notice verse 7 again. What then? In other words, what's the conclusion of, of all of this? Paul is trying to draw a conclusion. He says, what Israel sought so earnestly, it did not obtain, but the elect did. The elect did. In other words, he's simply saying that when you look at the nation of Israel, you see that the nation has, has not come into the new covenant that has been secured by the blood of Jesus Christ. They have not been saved. But it does not mean that God has forgotten them, nor has he excluded them. But as we said last week, God is seeking men, women, boys, and girls of every nation with reckless abandon to come to salvation in his son, Jesus Christ. So what was it that Israel was seeking so earnestly? That's the question at hand. See, he said, look, Israel sought it earnestly, but, but they didn't get it, but the elect did. Well, what is it that Israel was, was seeking? Now, this is very important. What they were seeking is righteousness. That's what they were seeking, righteousness. Paul's already told us back in Romans chapter 10, verses 2 through 4, how they went about their search was, was really a big problem of why they didn't find righteousness. And Paul says this, for I can testify about them, the Jews, that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge, since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God. That's the problem. They're seeking righteousness, but all they have is themselves as uh, as their remedy, uh, hey, we're going we're gonna to seek righteousness, but all we have is ourselves. So all we're going to come up with is self-righteousness, which is always inadequate. We must have God's righteousness. So they're seeking righteousness, but they did not know the righteousness that comes from God. So here's the problem. They sought to establish their own. They did not submit to God's righteousness. And here's, he's saying this is how we, we submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. So God's righteousness is available. How is it available? What do you need? You need to receive it as a gift by grace. You receive it by believing. You, you embrace it by faith. And the righteousness of God becomes your own. And, and there's, a whole, you know, there's a whole litany of things that talk about the righteousness of Jesus Christ becoming ours. That the, the, the righteousness of Jesus is imputed into those who believe. Imputed is just a big word that means it becomes your own. It comes to reign and rule in your life. What? The righteousness of God. How? Because Jesus Christ gives it to us as the benefit, as the provider of salvation. Ooh, by one sacrifice, as Hebrews 10.4 would say, 10.14 uh, would say, is that by one sacrifice, he's made holy, or he's made perfect forever those he is making holy. By one sacrifice, he makes us perfect. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ received in our lives makes us perfect for how long? Forever. This is the righteousness that the Jewish people didn't have knowledge about. All they had knowledge about was their own righteousness. And that righteousness is insufficient to secure our salvation. He says, but Christ is the end of the law so that there might be righteousness for... I, I love it when he says everyone. It's inclusive to everyone who believes. Now, what are they seeking for, these, the, the Jewish people? Of course, they're seeking righteousness. What, 
Well, that's the point of, of, of Romans chapter 10. Verse 3, they went out to establish their own righteousness instead of submitting themselves to the righteousness of God. They never learned that Christ was the end of the law so that there might be righteous for everyone who believes. They didn't know it was a, a matter of, of faith and not works. But they were seeking righteousness. What is righteousness? Being right with God. They said, hey, the way that we're going to be right with God is we're going to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. We're going to apply the formula of righteousness. If you do A and you do B, you get C. And they thought by keeping the law that that would allow them to be right in God's eyes. But the law, we remember, was only given to us to show that we were in need of a Savior. The law can't save. It only reveals our inadequacies, that, that we're not perfect. And so... They wanted to be right with God. They sought to be right with God. This is Israel's pursuit. They wanted the acceptance of God. Sometimes they called it eternal life. We were seeking eternal life. By the way, in, in, in Matthew chapter 19, we run into a guy who was called the rich young ruler. Maybe you remember the story, Matthew 19, and, and he encounters Jesus Christ, and he really has a good demeanor about him. He, he, he bows at the knees of Jesus Christ, and he asks a very important question. I mean, if you're going to ask any question, this is a question you ought to ask. Uh, good sir, what must I do to inherit or to receive eternal life? And Jesus begins to dialogue with this young man about what is required for eternal life. And so he first points them to the law. And the law, remember, is, is to show our inadequacies. And Jesus said, hey, these are some commandments. And the, the man said, no, no. You don't understand, since I was a young child, I've kept these commandments. In other words, I'm righteous enough, but I feel like there's something lacking in me, and I'm coming to you for a validation of, of what's for validation about what it is that is needed for a person to know for certain that they have eternal life. You know what Jesus did? He pointed him back to number one. You shall have no other God before me. He said, okay, this is what you need to do, young man. You want eternal life? Then go and sell all of your possessions, give the proceeds to the poor, and follow me. And the man went away sad because he had great wealth. And he was thinking, well, wait a minute. In the Jewish spectrum of righteousness, the righteous, whoever is righteous, they're the ones who receive the blessings of God. So God has heaped all of these blessings, all the riches. I'm a rich young ruler because evidently God has been pleased with my pursuit of self-righteousness. So Jesus, don't tell me that I have a God before God, that I'm an idolater, that I'm worshiping something other than the God who's given us the law. But that's what Jesus pointed out, didn't he? That this man had a huge gap between where he was and what God demanded. And he was blinded by his own pursuit of self-righteousness. And what Paul said in chapter 10, he said, look, they don't know. They have no knowledge of the righteousness of God. They only have knowledge of their own self-righteousness. But listen, I'm here to remedy that. I'm here to make it clear that, that God has a plan of redemption and his plan is that his son Jesus Christ would die on the cross in order that whoever would believe in him, you see, would have eternal life. That's why God has sent me into the world. And so this rich young ruler thought, well, all I got to do is keep the rules, I can be righteous and enough on, on my own, but Jesus pointed out, no, you can't. What you need is, is a Savior. Listen, Israel's problem wasn't that it lacked zeal. It had a lot of determination. Their problem was they didn't understand how to get righteousness, which leads us to the second question that's posed in, in Romans chapter 11, verse 7. What Israel sought so earnestly it did not obtain. But the elect did. And so the question is this, well, who in the world are the elect? And why did they merit it, their, their election? What did they do to merit their election? Because we know you must do something in order to receive something. 
But the answer is this, and and Paul gave it back in verse 5. The elect are chosen by grace. So too, at the present time, there's a remnant. How did they become the remnant? They were chosen. How? By grace. God's unmerited favor to all who will believe. So what did they do to merit that righteousness? In other words, how did they get it? Here's the beauty of the gospel. It's a stumbling stone to the Jew. Romans chapter 9, verse 30 through 32, it says this. What shall we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness, it means they didn't work for it. They they had no even clue of what they needed to do to work for it. Um, They could never be perfect. And listen, perfection is the requirements of a holy God. So here's the deal. Those who are, who are trying to be self-righteous as the means of getting to God are doomed. They're doomed. He said, look, the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it. I mean, that would have been frustrating for the guy who was keeping all the rules. He, he was out. He, did, he, he didn't make it. But the guy who had no regard for the rules at all All he did was believe that Jesus was the remedy for his sins. That the death of of Jesus on the cross, his burial, his resurrection was God's plan to redeem the world. And whoever believes on him will have eternal life. They won't perish. They didn't even seek righteousness because self-righteousness ends with yourself and it cannot help you. To come into a right relationship with God. That requires supernatural intervention. It requires God's activity on our behalf. He says, but listen, they've obtained it, a righteousness. And here it comes, this is big, don't miss it. That is by faith. How How did they receive the righteousness? How did they become righteousness? They became righteous by faith. But Israel who pursued a law of righteousness, that is what we can do to impress a perfect God with our imperfection. We have good intent, but we have no power to be perfect. He says, but Israel, who pursued a law of righteousness, has not attained it. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. The stumbling stone is Christ. Christ is the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone in which our faith rises. We put our faith in Him who's completed all of the requirements for us to be made righteous. He's completed it. And then in chapter 10, Paul chronicles how faith takes flight in our lives. How we move from dead in our sins to being made vitally and vibrantly alive in Jesus Christ our Lord. He says, here's how how it happens. Here's how faith takes takes flight. He says, here is the word of faith that we're proclaiming. He says, this is it. You guys ready? In, you know, trucker terminology, CB terminology. You got your ears on, good buddy? You ready to hear it? Here it comes. This is how faith takes flight in our lives, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised them from the dead, you will be saved. Now, that's a big statement. We, we pass over that so often as like a little formula for Uh, for our salvation. And listen, it's powerful. We got to understand what it means here, that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, what we're saying is Jesus is God, that Jesus is God incarnate, that Jesus, that God has become flesh and made his dwelling amongst us as Emmanuel. He's come to live amongst us. What? To show us what he's like, which is perfect but also to show us that he has a great desire 
He's pursuing our lives with reckless abandon. To what end? That he might set us free from our slavery to sin. That he might provide an antidote, a remedy to what ails us all, which, is going, which has us dead, and which we can't escape without supernatural intervention. He's come to make what is dead, that's me, alive. And it happens when I declare my faith in what Christ has finished to set me free. So if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you know, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you know what you also have to believe? That he died. Well, what did he die for? He died in order to uh, be an atoning sacrifice for the sins of the world that everyone who believes might become righteous, might know the salvation of God. And that's why Romans 10, 13, and tells us this, and, and, and from this verse, answer this question to me, how many are chosen by grace? You tell me, how many are chosen by grace? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How many? And it's not a trick question, it's yes. The theological, a good, uh, you know, anytime there's a theological a hard question, you just say, the answer is yes. How many can be saved by grace? Yes. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Here's the thing. It's tragic. Not everyone calls on the name of the Lord. Not everyone confesses with their mouth that Jesus is Lord. Not everyone believes in their heart that God has raised him from the dead. Their faith could take flight, but not everyone does. Even some, after hearing the glorious good news of, the, of life in Jesus Christ, of his sacrifice, of his suffering, of his, uh, of his death for our sins, they still don't believe Paul says, some by grace respond to the good news. They called on the name of the Lord and were saved. But others, others were hardened. Romans 11, 8, others were hardened. And we ask, how? How, how, are, how are you hardened toward this good news? How are you hardened to Jesus Christ? And this is where Paul turns to the Old Testament to prove his points. He quotes Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 4, and he attaches to it seamlessly Isaiah chapter 29, 10 in a brilliant Old Testament mashup. So he's got the law and he's got the prophets mixed together in his answer, and it makes perfect sense. Romans eleven eight. God gave them a spirit of stupor. This is how they're hardened. Others were hardened. Because God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes so that they could not see, and ears so that they could not hear to this very day. God gave them. Now hold your horses before you think that God is in the damning business. Because this is where we understand the lyrics of the song. As we go back and we see the context of what Deuteronomy 29 is all about anyway. And then we can understand the statement and why Paul has brilliantly decided to put that in his argument here. So in Deuteronomy chapter 29, it's a summary of all the things that God has graciously, magnanimously done for the children of Israel as he's delivered them from slavery. Moses is recounting for these Israelites Making the point that, listen, because of God's graciousness, because of God's activity, because of God's presence in your very midst, you should now respond with your whole heart, your whole lives, giving over to him and respecting this covenant that he's given for you to keep, all because of his blessings. In fact, he says this in Deuteronomy 29, 2. He says, your eye have seen all that the Lord did in Egypt to Pharaoh. You didn't just hear about it. I mean, these folks were eyewitnesses of all of the plagues and all of the mercies and all of the activity. I mean, they saw 
pillar of fire by night. Talk about a cosmic nightlight. They had nothing to fear. Why? God was right there. He's manifested himself in this, in this pillar of fire. And by day, a cloud of smoke. Hey, I wonder where he got. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> wonder where God is today, and he, he's manifesting himself in his activity toward the people of God, toward Israel. No excuse. They've seen him with their own eyes. With your own eyes, you saw all those great trials, those miraculous signs and great wonders, but to this day, the Lord has not given you a mind that understands or eyes that see or ears that hear. But listen, this is the point of the passage. Moses saying, but let's rectify that now. Let's rectify that. I'm going I'm to give you some insight into what has happened so that you have some context to the bigger point that God is doing amongst you as a people, that he's delivering you out of bondage to bring you into plenty, to bring you into freedom, to bring you into blessing. Let me explain that to you, what God is doing on your behalf. That's what Deuteronomy 29 is all about. He says, look, during the 40 years, get this through your head, guys, the 40 years that, that I've led you through the desert, your clothes did not wear out. They're saying, yeah, 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 God's done some great things, you know, pillar of fire by night, cloud by day, plagues, all that kind of stuff. But what, what's God done for me lately? He's going, look at your clothes, dude. You haven't been to the gap in 40 years, but they're still looking like they're almost brand new. And listen, your sandals have not worn out. Explain that one to me. And they'd all have to scratch their head and say, yeah, God has advocated on our behalf personally. My clothes have not worn out. My sandals have not worn out. Forty years in the desert. Look, you ate no bread. Why? Because manna fell from heaven. You drank no wine, so you can say, well, I was, you know, drunk the whole 40 years, and I couldn't figure out what God was doing. Said, no, I did this so that you might know. See, well, he gave them a, a mind of stupor. He put them to sleep. They, God gave them eyes. They can't be held responsible for them not recognizing it and responding to God's goodness and grace. No. He said, look, God did all of these things in order that you might know that I am the Lord your God. Let's break it down. God said, look, you couldn't deliver yourself from slavery. I did it. And while I was doing it, I provided everything that you needed so you wouldn't think that it was your own effort that saved you. I saved you. Supernatural intervention. But don't be blind to that provision now that you're about to enter into the promised land. Don't be dull and forget what I've done for you. I want you to see my provision of salvation. The same is true for Isaiah chapter 29 verse 10. Isaiah the prophet is speaking about God's discipline. He says, the the Lord has brought a deep sleep that is a spirit of stupor, a deep sleep, and has sealed your eyes that is... He's blinded the prophets so that they can't hear from the Lord. And covered your heads, that is, taken away wisdom from the seers. Why in the, world would make, why in the world would God make his people sleepy? The Lord says, these people come near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. This is why God didn't make them sleepy. They made themselves sleepy because they were not interested in having an encounter with the living God. How do I know? Because Isaiah says, their worship of me is made up of only the rules taught by man. They don't want to know me. All they want to do is know the rules. They want to know the formula so that they can get to the blessing. They don't know that I'm the blessing. And they can only know that if they worship me with their hearts, not their mouths, not their lips, their hearts. And Paul, what a mashup. In essence, you can't see because you don't want to see. You're sleepy and cannot hear because you're not interested in me, the living God. You're interested only in yourself. 
Others were hardened not because grace wasn't available, but because grace was not appealing to them. Listen, it happened to Jesus. John chapter 12, verse 37, Jesus faces the same disinterest in, uh, of people in supernatural intervention. Here's what it says. Even after Jesus had done all these miraculous signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. By the way, in John chapter 12, before this statement is made, we have the raising of Lazarus from the dead. He says, even when you saw a guy who was dead in the grave for four days, his flesh was already decomposing. They said, please, Jesus, sisters of Lazarus, don't move the stone away because by now, King James Version, our brother stinketh. It means there's a foul odor that is going to be coming from his body because that guy is dead. He's dead as the proverbial doornail. He's dead. Four days, he's been dead. And Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. And the guy who was dead for four days lumbers out of the tomb. And still, people would not believe. That's incredible. They've seen it with their own eyes. All these miraculous signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. Was grace available? Yeah, they just they weren't interested. They weren't interested in in worshiping the one who's raised the dead. I hope you see it. They were hardened because of their insistence on going all Frank Sinatra on God. They wanted to do it their own way. I did it my... I didn't have the video clip for that. Way. They just wanted to do it their way. And listen, your way always fails. Your way can't lead you to God. Only God's way, only God supernaturally intervening on our behalf can bring us to Him. That's why Jesus said, look, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father because He cannot be righteous enough on His own. He must have imputed righteousness. He must have my righteousness. And this is the miracle of Jesus Christ, that he who knew no sin became sin for us. Why? That we might become the righteousness. We might become the righteousness of God. You see, only, the only way is in Jesus Christ, whose blood serves as an atoning sacrifice and whose death is a propitiation, a satisfaction of God's wrath, so that we might miraculously, supernaturally, by faith, become the righteousness of God. That's quote number one. Now, in quote number two, Paul goes to Psalm 69, famous imprecatory psalm, which just is a fancy way of saying a song that curses people for not following God. How'd you like that? Hey, everyone turn to uh, song number 69. Today we're going to talk about the curse of God on those who do not respond in faith to His grace. We'd all be happily singing along. That's a good rhythm, right? Hard to dance to, but uh, kind of infectious. So this psalm's all about the curse on people who don't, who don't follow God, who don't submit to the grace that he has for us that would save us. In fact, it's about being an enemy of God. And this particular psalm mentions those who would refuse to come to Christ as being cursed. So Romans eleven nine 9 through 10, it's David quoting, I mean, it's Paul quoting David. And David says, and by the way, that's a big deal when you, when you put David's name in there. Everyone perks up a little, oh, David, David, he's got something to say to us. About knowing God. He's a man after God's own heart. Better listen now. Here's what David says. May their table be, become a snare, a trap, a, a stumbling block, and a retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see, and their backs be bent forever. Two elements here. First of all, we have a table. And that table is going to be a snare and a trap, a stumbling block. 
Now, that's very interesting. Because, you know, when I go to my table and I sit down to eat, I'm not thinking, well, you know, I better be careful. This might be a snare. This might be a trap. My little bowl of Cheerios might come back to haunt me later on. You know, you sit down at your table and you're pretty confident, right, that you're about to enjoy a, a great meal. Well, what, well, what kind of things are the Jewish people sitting down to feast them on? It's the law. That's that's their life. It's the law. And so they're eating it up. And, and, and David said, look, if the law leads you to, to deny Jesus Christ, it's a snare, it's a trap. Don't think that the law is going to lead you to righteousness. It cannot. All the law is going to do is make you aware that you are not perfect. And you need supernatural intervention. You need a Savior. Paul says in 10.4, Christ is the end of the law. Did you hear that? He's the end of the law, that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. He's the end. You can't put your hope in the law. Put your hope, put your faith in Jesus Christ who can make you righteous. You know what John chapter 1 verse 5 says? It says that Jesus came into the world to be the light of all men. The light shines in the darkness. And you want to hear a great tragedy? And the darkness has not understood it. The fault isn't with the light. The light is shining. The fault is with those who would deny their need for light. They would rather stay in the darkness. And listen, that's the problem of those who would not receive Christ. Paul says, and, and David, Paul quotes David saying, look, they remain, this is the problem. If they put their hope in the law, they remain in darkness. Can I tell you the consequences of remaining in darkness? Bent, you will forever be bent with the weight of forging your own righteousness, which, which will always be inadequate to save you. Listen, Paul does us a great favor. He does a great job of pointing us to the need for Jesus Christ. He is the light that comes into the world to bring light to just a few people. No, to, to every man. And the tragedy is, is some who hear about the good news of Jesus Christ still in the heart say, no, thank you. No, thank you. I'd rather make it on my own. And Paul's saying that is a failing way. There's no way that you can make it on your own. See, when you understand the words, it makes a little bit more sense about, oh, that's stupor, this blind eyes, this ears that cannot hear. So it's like God damning people. It's people saying, no, thank you. To God. But you're here this morning. You're intelligent people. I can tell because you're still, still awake. You're, you're intelligent. We need more than intelligence, by the way. We also need the pursuit of the Holy Spirit to bring us to salvation. And the good news is, is that the Spirit of God is here pursuing us. He's pursuing us with reckless abandon. And here's the hope. That if we hear by the Holy Spirit's enabling us, we might respond in faith and believe and be saved. Perhaps this morning your ears have been opened for the first time. Your eyes have been enlightened for the first time. And the truth is beginning to seek in, sink into your hearts. And you're saying, well, what do I do with this great good news? I say this, you respond to it. You put your faith in Jesus Christ. Our faith takes wings when we, with our mouth, confess that Jesus is Lord. And with our hearts, we believe that God has raised him from the dead. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What a glorious day.
if today is the day that you put your faith in Jesus Christ. What a glorious day if by faith you take a step forward and say, I'm going to go talk to that guy and and ask him to pray for me as as I put my trust in Jesus Christ. What a glorious moment if you just take a pin and, and mark off that top little box on the back of the card. My response today is, I trust Christ to save me. And then you tell someone so the journey can begin. You know, just like everyone here was born, am I right? Everyone here was born. Jesus said, if you're to see the kingdom of God, you must be born again. And when you were born in this world, I, I, I think, All of you came in as a little, tiny, helpless baby. And so it is true when we're spiritually born again. We're born as a baby. And so then we need a community of believers to come around us and and begin to nurture us and and feed us and and help us to understand what God's purpose and will is for our lives. That's why when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we don't just keep it to ourselves. We tell someone else so that there can be care for us and we can begin to grow in Jesus Christ. We have a whole process here at at Valencia Hills Community Church to help you grow in Christ. That's why we want you to tell us if you've put your faith in Him. By the way, maybe you've put your faith in Him, but you've never followed in believer's baptism. I say, what's the holdup? You say, well, I'm not ready. I say, well, have you asked Christ to be your Savior? Then you're ready. The problem isn't not that you're ready, it's that you're not willing. And so maybe the Spirit of God is pressing on you to make that decision. Hey, I'd be willing maybe next week or the week after or one week really soon on a Sunday to to follow Christ in believer's baptism. It's not difficult, but it requires you to be cooperative, submitting to the will of God. Maybe you've done that, but you've been traveling on a path that leads you away from God. And God today, His voice is very clear, unmistakable to you. Come back to me. Come back to me. You're mine. I bought you with a price. You don't belong to yourself. You were bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. You belong to me. And I have a plan and a purpose for you. I have a path that leads to righteousness for, so, so that my name can be glorified. Maybe you're just here bearing a big burden. Listen, the Lord wants to come alongside of you, and he's given you all these great people to do that. So maybe you just need somebody to pray for you. Whatever you need, this is your time. As we stand, would you stand with me? As we sing, as God leads, you come.